wonderful thing, so thanks for inviting me once again. Um, I spoke at this meeting um, three years ago, uh, and I'm going to recover some of that ground because really the story of Invapitch as it relates to TAC is a long running one from when we started getting out of Miranet and into Infiniband. Um, uh, and it runs till now and is ongoing and there's a lot left to do. So um, I want to recover some of the history of, uh, um, so if you remember my talk from three years ago, which was also early in the morning, so you probably blocked it out and it's fine. Um, but you'll see some of that again. But then we've added some chapters on the stuff that we've done together um, with the team here at OSU and in Bapich. So, um, so and again, thanks to all the people who give you the money. Um, once you become a director, you always remember to put it in the slide. Thank the people who give you the money. Um, but a special thanks to DK and his team here at OSU. Um, we would not have gotten this all together. And although I'm the one who gets to come and give the talk, um, lots and lots of people work on the machines at TAC. And if they didn't put them together, um, things would never work. So um, let me just jump to the end with a slide that Jerome Vienne put together here. Um, so uh, you know, one of my recurring stories is without projects like Invapage, machines would never work as well as they do. Um, and that really the open source contribution is huge and Invapage in particular is huge. Um, and this has happened once again. So this is our latest graph of job launch on Stampede 2 on the Knights landing nodes, which as you know have lots and lots and lots of cores, as we will talk about. Um, and this is time for job launch of Invapage in the line that looks like it should and um, the Lorentz transform there where we're asymptotically approaching affinity is Intel MPI um, for launching jobs. And so. Um, this is in nodes, but we're doing 64 MPI tasks per node in this case. So um, the, we're going out in Invapage here to launch in 229,376 MPI tasks, which is less than 20 seconds um, with Invapage. And I think Jerome stops doing tests once it hits three or four minutes and he gets bored. Um, but it looks like it'd be, I don't know, next year's conference to launch that um, with Intel MPI at this point, um, which of course is the default standard industry MPI. Um, and those things are always catching up and wouldn't be there uh, if it wasn't for what we did. So you know, once again, Invapage has saved us at large scale, um, even on our very newest machines after so many years um, of MPI libraries. So um, let me just back up. I can't resist. I don't know why I left the SC15 logo in the template. but. Uh, um, do a quick overview um, of TAC and then talk about our history with Invapage. So at this point, um, you know, Stampede and Stampede 2 are where we've directly partnered with the Invapage team. Um, we are now in the process of winding down Stampede. It's mostly gone. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And ramping up Stampede 2, where you see that we're launching jobs. Um, they have been remarkably productive systems over their lifespan. We're now at four and a half years on Stampede. We're closing in on the nine million job mark um, over 3.3 billion processor hours and counting um, 3,500 projects, 400 institutions. We rolled 14,000 accounts onto Stampede 2 on day one that were active from Stampede. If you count inactive accounts, we're pushing 40,000 um, at this point. And we're still in the last quarter oversubscribed by seven to one. Um, these are the things you know about us that we put out lots and lots of jobs. Um, at TAC now, we actually have lots of different platforms. And we have lots of different interconnects. Um, so we like to think that when we talk about Invapage and the importance of these things, we have at least some comparative basis to know what we're talking about. We have InfiniBand systems. We have OmniPath systems. We have Aries connected Cray systems. We have Ethernet connected systems. We have some other crazy things with direct connected PCI or the Microsoft FPGA interconnect um, that clusters FPGAs together out the back of the machine with weird cables. Um, so we have at least five different interconnects that we look at across our platforms. Um, and again, we hold a whole bunch of data. We do a lot of different systems. We, we have one system called Chameleon, which we've also partnered with the Invapage team on, where users get root. Um, it's the world's greatest security nightmare. We do, um, and then just to, since we have that nightmare on a different segment of the network, let me assure you, we have HIPAA, FISMA, and FERPA data as well. So um, all over the place. And of course, the why we do this is to do cool, cool things with them, like build rocket engines. Um, that's the Firefly stage booster that was designed with Stampede, did all the computation for that. We do plasma fusion stuff. You guys all know what we do. <laughs> um, genomic analysis, that one was the cover of nature. Um, um, sort of one subspecies of human arising from three subspecies in Europe. Um, so we do all these cool things, but to do that, we need um, really good system software. And so our experience with Invapage just to summarize, now through 
um, I think 11 years that we've worked with DK's team, uh, is that it's consistently our highest performance MPI, despite looking at five networks and a million vendors and a million MPI implementations. Um, it is consistently our most reliable MPI. Um, and in fact, whenever there's a problem and something's crashing, um, I sort of ask, What's, what was it compiled with? And they say Intel MPI for start. A lot of the time, and I'm like, have we tried it with Mvapich before we file bug report? Um, so that'll tell us what's really wrong. Um, so it's our most reliable, and as I just showed, it's always the fastest starting at large scale versus any of the vendor MPIs we've ever seen. Um, and none of this just happens to be happy coincidence. It's because of a lot of hard work and a lot of very system-specific tuning that the team here at OSU has done for us. So um, I feel like we owe the team here, and one of the reasons I'm always happy to come up here, not that I just love air travel, is that um, we really owe a huge debt <laughs> to the Mvapich team for making sure that because they tune for the systems that we have, our systems are better than everybody else's. But seriously, everyone's systems get better um, when uh, we have good system software that's tuned for topology. And so as we go through the history, I want to show a few examples where that's been really, really key. Um, so through every system we've done, and especially the last few, where we've had this closer and closer partnership, um, it's been important to work on each new system. And in fact, when I get to the slide on the work we have left to do, it is because every time we bring up a new interconnect or a new type of node at scale, there's new tuning to do. None of this stuff ever works well the first time you bring it up um, on a new platform. So, uh, so lately it's intranode communication is one of the biggest parts, right? We're doing 64 MPI tasks per node. It's a bad idea, but we still have users doing it occasionally who don't have open MP codes. On Knight's Landing, we have heterogeneous nodes increasingly. You have GPUs, you have FPGAs, we have all sorts of devices. Um, and then, of course, you know, the new interconnect has new performance characteristics in each generation, and every time there's a little tweak we need to do to the MPI library on top of that system software. And this never shows up at a vendor sales pitch when they come and try and sell you um, a machine, but it's always true. Um, so this tuning is why the machines work well. So if we go back to when we got started at this, we started doing um, and this actually predates me at TAC, although I had my own parallel thing at the centers I was working at at the time. Um, but, you know, we all started out doing, actually, I started in FDDI clustering. Um, that was a bad idea. But still, um, and ThinNet, where you had to worry about taps. And you could, interestingly enough, hook cables together and introduce noise several links down. Um, I'm, I'm glad those days are never coming back. But, uh, um, but not surprisingly, we did the first Linux cluster attack in 2003, and like most in that era, it was connected via Miranet. Um, and then in 2005, we started to look at putting in Miranet and some of the early IB, if you remember Topspin before Mellanox bought them. Mellanox was making the silicon, just the chips originally, and many companies were out there, like Silverstorm, Topspin, all those guys making switches around those and cards around those chips. Um, but we started evaluating. And um, we sort of realized in 2004 and 2005 that um, you know, this is sort of when Linux clusters were really starting to make their way up the top 500 list. Um, again, almost half the list was still big vector type machines or custom machines. Um, yes, there was one core per socket. So when we said number of processors, we also meant number of nodes. We were going to dual socket, single core. Um, so. Uh, we started with Mvapich on those top spin switches, 092 and then 095 with Mellanox. Notice they all start with zero. Um, so these were the good old days before things were formally released. Um, and we saw pretty good performance characteristics um, on these IB things in terms of latency. Uh, so, and apparently I have this slide twice. Um, so the various different IBs. Um, that we had there, and we started to look at other things beyond just latency, so MPI ping pongs, especially as um, we got larger messages, the InfiniBand bandwidth had an enormous advantage, um, the InfiniBand latency was always also as good or better than anything out there at the time. Um, we did some application scalability, and again, you saw that, and so again here, number of processors pretty much equals number of nodes. Um, and here we were thinking about zero to 50, and now we're thinking about 230,000 to 500,000. But um, so things have changed a lot in that decade. But uh, Ethernet obviously wasn't getting the job done. We needed advanced interconnects. Um, 
and InfiniBand was even outperforming the MirrorNet at the time. So we're like, well, it's new. The software starts with zero, which is always a little scare scary. Um, but we should give this stuff a try. So in 2006, um, with much bravery from Carl Schultz, who will be here tomorrow, and Tommy Menyard in deploying this, we built the Lone Star 3 system that was number 12 on the top 500 back then. And that was our first really big InfiniBand system. Um, and it was released in June 2006, OFED 1. Um, we started running on it in June 2006, because Tommy and Carl were brave. Um, we had the first sort of luster over IB at the time. And mainly because now their MPIs were out, we made Mvapich the primary stack on that machine. Um, and you know, we added on to it in 2007. It was very, very successful through those years. Um, but then I was working with Tech, and we're like, well, this is great. This stuff all works. Um, at, you know, starting at, uh, I think we started at six or 800 nodes on that machine, and then grew it out to about 1,000. And we're like, well, this works. Obviously, it'll work at a much bigger scale. So let's do something scary. So um, we went from sort of the one row of Lone Star, and in 2008 was our first really big system attack, Ranger, um, which a lot of you probably remember. And we went up to 4,000 blades, 16,000 sockets, um, and now we were in quad core, so 62,936 cores um, at the time. Um, and we went in something we haven't really done since, so there was some learning. Um, we both tried nodes without hard drives, and we tried um, uh, no Ethernet, and went to SDRIB as the only interconnect um, between the nodes with crazy 12x cables. I really sort of wish those caught on. We still have those switches. Um, down there. Um, the physical and cabling is always an interesting part <laughs> of the uh, whole build. I can't, um, those 12x cables were sort of close to a pound per foot, as I recall. Um, so we had five or six tons of cable by the time all was said and done, I mean, <laughs> putting the machine together. Um, but with those big thick cables, we only had one cable per three nodes, and everything else was internal to the blade switch. So we had 4,000 nodes and only 1,400 cables, which was good because we had to replace them all at least once. So. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so we only ran 2,800 cables, 1,400, and then when we ran the 1,400 again. Um, the other story of advanced interconnects is you always replace the cables. My fingers are still crossed on Stampede 2 because we haven't had to do it yet. So, um, but yeah, so we had a seven-stage fabric. Um, we had these giant switches, again, made from Mellanox chips that were Andy Bechtelsheim's uh, brainchild. And this was the number four system on the top 500. But of course, on day one, um, you know, the InfiniBand works. The chips are good, the protocol's there, but there was lots of stuff we had to tune, and that's where we started interacting with the Mvapich team, was when we started realizing what the challenges were to tune for new systems. So, um, so starting at cluster 2007, which was about the same time um, this was coming up, and that happened to be in Austin, and VK came down, um, met with Carl, met with Tommy, um, and started, first of all, thinking about job launch, because again, Mvapich has always had a huge advantage in job launch over everything else. And then we moved on to looking at the ConnectX cards and how we can tune collectives, because we went from sort of dual core, dual socket nodes to quad core, quad socket nodes. So we started to have to deal with this intra-node bandwidth and tuning. Um, and it was really great. And DK and team dug in. Um, you know, At the same time, we were working with Mellanox um, to do the OpenSM, because of course, Sun had said, It'll work great, just run it on a switch. And it's like, I don't know, we're going to run it on a host. We're going to run the OpenSM from Mellanox. Um, as it turns out, we were bringing up that 4100 endpoint network. In the initial version, sweeps took about 40 minutes. And when you're bringing up a network like that, the average time to lose a route and have to sweep is about 35 minutes. Um, so the, uh, you know, there were days where the network just did nothing but sweeps. Um, we eventually, working with Mellanox, um, got that down to where we could do a sweep in under a minute. Um, so the network was mostly quiet and mostly just moving traffic most of the time. Um, and we got huge differences in collective performance. And in fact, the thing uh, that in particularly we proved um, going from OFED 1.1 and Infich Batfitch 098 to 099 was being able to get really good bandwidth at smaller and smaller message size, right? Because of course we tell everybody to write codes with really big messages. And in fact, everybody writes codes with really small messages most of the time. And there's a lot of broadcasts and barriers and crazy things like that. Um, and so being able to move that curve back to the left in this particular case from Lone Star to Ranger meant we started getting that effective bandwidth we wanted with smaller messages. Um, so this was sort of our first real collaborative tuning thing 
and we saw that, hey, for real users, this makes a lot of difference on real applications. Um, and maybe we should continue these kinds of things. And again, um, we were comparing to OpenMPI at the time, and again, through that tuning process, over time, we got both more bandwidth out of collectives, we got lower latency out of, that's a send receive and a broadcast um, that we're looking at there. So we realized that lots of good things could happen if you pay attention to this part of the stack um, in terms of applications. So starting with the Stampede system, um, which was funded in 2011, we're like, this collaboration really matters to us. So we made the OSU team a part of our project team for doing this. And it was our first sort of funded collaboration. Um, began back in 2011. We put the machine into production on January 7th of 2013. It officially ended January 7th of 2017, four years later, but we've extended it while we're deploying the other machine. So about half of it is still running. Um, again, you can see the numbers. Um, I would say we made Mvapich the default MPI in this early on and tried to force users this way. Um, probably millions of that eight and a half million jobs ran a lot better than they would have because, because of Mvapich um, over the life of the machine. So, um, and again, this one also had a lot of heterogeneity and also had lots of things that we discovered we wanted to tweak. Um, and for those of you who don't remember, or never ran on Stampede, it's sort of really two machines. It's a 6400 node cluster in dual socket, eight core Intel Sandy Bridge processors. You have sort of 102,400 processors and a couple of petaflops. In the base machine, um, again, lots and lots of InfiniBand cables. At this point, we were on uh, FDR <laughs> InfiniBand um, for the machine. Uh, but then we put in those first generation Xeon Phi cards, the mic cards, in all the nodes. Some of them had two. Some of them also had a GPU. Um, in there, which were sort of 60 cores running Linux on the other side of the PCI bus, basically another computer inside the computer. Um, you throw those in, we had more than 500,000 cores um, and millions of potential hardware threads to run on. Um, about 10 petaflops or so, um, 9.6 when you add those together. Um, so once again, we have all sorts of things to do. So. Uh, you know, in the base cluster mode, everything worked great. Um, thanks to Mvapich, right? That's where we were. On Ranger is the red line. Lone Star 4 was in the middle. Um, I didn't think you wanted the comprehensive history. Um, and then uh, Stampede up there. Obviously, each generation of InfiniBand, we peak at a, a higher and higher level in the software. Let us keep up. And again, you can see the knee of the curve is moving down to smaller and smaller messages as both the IB and the software gets better. Um, so we were very happy about that. Um, we were very happy with our latency, um, you know, less than a, or right around a microsecond uh, inside a rack. Um, two and a half microseconds, worst case, there's 100 meters of uh, fiber in there. Um, so you have a, you know, maybe 15% of that is just speed of light in the fiber I mean, <laughs> um, across that, right? We have almost 200 cabinets that we're running between um, in the five hop case, you know, two switches, but big core switch, so it looks like three hops. Um, Again, you start to see big latency differences depending on where you want. So uh, again, with the, the team here, we started on some topology aware grants. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. Um, again, the physical part, I hated, we cut out four of these switches. We have four of them left um, with what's there. I hated taking them out. Physically, this was my favorite machine <laughs> of all the ones we've built um, through the decades. Uh, we had these 648 port core switches. Um, one thing we pride ourselves on, and you can all give kudos to Carl, because he, um, when he's here tomorrow, he fabbed all these things on the side um, to actually route the cabling through. Um, if you've dealt with the cables, um, and we had 75 miles of fiber um, on top of the machine in the data center for this, and, um, and we didn't have the great 12x thing to reduce the number, so we had 6,400 nodes. You have a link to the leaf switch and then a link to the core switch, so slightly oversubscribed. We had about 11,000 um, InfiniBand cables to run. Um, in this machine, and with the good cable management, they were, other than some cabling problems where we had to replace a batch um, of cables, they were remarkably reliable through the life, and again, we still have several thousand of them running five years later, um, doing well, and by the way, once you put them in those bundles, don't ever take them out, just add new ones. Um, but, uh, so again, lots and lots of work to get that up, but many, many good things happened um, associated with that, um, but again, as we started to reach the large scale, we began to realize how much topology matters. In addition to the latency differences that you see, um, you know, there's again this theory that, well, 
we have source code, then you have a device driver and an operating system, and computers are computers, so it should just perform the same. Um, but there's huge topology differences between the way we build these machines. So, um, and this is just, I think, it helps to have a visualization. Again, we ran the, the IB mapping tools to come up with this. But uh, um, so we did essentially a slightly oversubscribed, somewhat concurrent fat tree in Stampede, so you can actually see the eight core switches that form those trunks um, in the network topology there. Um, so we have sort of a thick middle and thinner at the edges, right? You see a lot of machines deployed in something like, so that's Gordon from San Diego, one of their older machines now, um, but it was in a Taurus, right? So you have a lot more connectivity locally. So if you're doing mesh, your nearest neighbor, those are great, um, but it has very different characteristics if you're doing sort of global things, right? So, um, and yet we make the assumption that if we just have one MPI library, then it'll just deal with that, and those topology differences don't matter. When in fact they do, right? It's really important to start embedding this topology information both into how your MPI algorithms work, right, in terms of how you do collectives over these very different topologies, um, and to how you schedule as well, right? And how you pick those MPI tasks um, and put them across. And you can have really dramatic differences if you actually take into account that machines, you know, um, Cray is now the dragonfly. Um, or modified dragonfly, um, but depending on your machine and how you hook the switches together, even with the exact same technologies, um, you can have very, very different levels of connectivity, and it's really important that your software layers understand this stuff um, and embed information about it. So anyway, we brought the machine up, it was doing great, um, but there's always stuff to do, and even through the, the years of running um, Stampede, uh, one of the great things about having the Invapage guys on our team is we kept making improvements as the years went on. They got better and better. So um, one particular one I want to show was from the first year. So we'd gone into production. Um, and there were some, shall we say, interesting things going on, we noticed, particularly around the Xeon Phi's, right? Because now we have this node inside a node that has to relay through from the card back through the host and then out to the network. So of course, there's sort of tuning you need to do there. Um, and as it turns out, this looks sort of reasonable. Um, this is transferring data between the CPU and the mic mini integrated core. That's the Xeon Phi card there. Um, and so that sort of looks like what you want. We get pretty good bandwidth, sort of nearing. As you get to big messages, we sort of max out what your PCI transfer is. Not really, but six gigabytes a second, maybe do eight. Um, pretty close to it, but this all looks good. Um, you know, this is again, in the node, but across the PCI bus between the two kinds of processors and the two instances of the operating system running there. Is that um, PCI2? Uh, this is Gen 3. Um, so, uh, so again, yeah, Gen 3, those cards were by 8, I think. So, um, Gen 3 by 8. So, this looked good. This did not look good. Um, so, this was one of the early problems we had. And basically, there was. Um, a feature in the PCI controller chipset um, at the time was that things where the CPU was the bus master and initiating transfers were really fast, if another device was initiating the transfer, um, it could be awful. And also there was some socket effects here that I didn't bring into as to which socket you put things in. Um, but so this is the CPU transferring to the mic um, was pretty fast. Well, actually, so this is the transfer in offload mode. Right, so in this case, the CPU is controlling everything, and I did it DK, I walked away from the mic. I knew I would. I mean, <laughs> I'll do it again, too. Um, the one on the other side is MPI bandwidth, um, when we got started. Um, because, of course, in MPI, where your MPI task is, it tries to initiate the transfer. When we were going the other direction, it was awful. And even in the, it was better if the CPU is initiating the transfer, um, but still not as good as offload bandwidth. Um, went to this MPI mode. So that's where we started. Um, so, uh, and of course, having this sort of asymmetry between um, where your MPI task is, whether it's running on the CPU or on the, the Xeon Phi, or even if it's between Xeon Phi's across the network, is, shall we say, undesirable for scientific applications, right? That's really sort of bad. Um, so again, there were interim steps that I have cut out, but to make a long story relatively short, um, over about a year, um, we went from that being the performance in offload to that being the performance um, within Vapich and Intel MPI was still not nearly as good. 
Um, but in this case, we made changes. We being not me, but the OSU team um, made changes to allow the, uh, essentially, when the MPI was set up, there would be a proxy and the host would always initiate the transfer. And so the MPI performance went from that thing, um, which is not at all impressive, to that. Um, over a year or two of the life of the system, um, where we're much closer to what we get. And in fact, we're as good as the offload mode um, where it's controlling it. Um, now, as of Skylake, the PCI controller is much smarter um, about doing this. Um, but yes, that was never a bug, it was a feature. Um, <laughs> according to the, and of course, the PCI controller is integrated onto the CPU nowadays, right? So it's really hard to change um, <laughs> once you've deployed a system. Um, how that works. But this is just an example of how by collaborating over time, even after deployment, um, without changing the hardware for a system that already exists, without changing what we had to buy, we can get really dramatic performance differences. And frankly, that made MPI on the Xeon Phi's livable. Um, that was really not, right? Most things, unless you were super coarse grain, were just atrocious in MPI mode. They worked fine on the card itself, but as soon as you got off it, it was terrible. And this just made it much, much, much better. Um, over the life of Stampede. So, um, from there, let's talk about um, newer and better things. And now, um, Stampede is starting to fade away. We have the first phase of Stampede 2, has been in production for a little while now. Um, again, very different machine, lots of node types to think about. So we have phase one um, up and running today. That's 4,204 Knights Landing processors. And now we don't have this in the node symmetry um, issue. We have a whole set of different issues, um, but these are self-hosted. So the Knight's Landing is just a single socket node, but that is the primary processor. Um, and we have, now we've gone from, on this machine we're running OmniPath 1 um, instead of InfiniBand. We're still in a fat tree topology. Um, we have the Ethernet fabric and stuff. We've gone away from the just IB um, to run everything. Uh, so you can still get to the node um, when you take the IB down. Uh, so, and all of the stuff listed as phase one is up and running now. We're actually have just started deploying phase two, um, which is around Xeon processors, the new Skylakes. And so I had a bunch of non-disclosure slides from the review, but Intel officially launched Skylake a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I just took the words non-disclosure off and brought them anyway. Um, so uh, now it's public, but we're adding, we've already put in all the core network and the core switches. And so we're just adding in these last 30 or so racks of Skylake um, into the system. Those should be there by October. Um, you'll see the numbers for those by supercomputing. And then we're going to do a small phase three sometime in the distant future when the 3D crosspoint dims, um, when, if um, the 3D crosspoint dims come out, let's call it 2018 um, as a round number. But uh, the non volatile RAM, you know, 512 gigabyte dims that are coming, um, just in a small segment of the machine to add yet another uh, layer to the memory hierarchy something to think about in tuning. So if you think about this from a network perspective, not only did we change um, technologies, but we have two kinds of nodes. We have single socket 68 core nodes, a long way from our one core per processor thing. Um, and then we have dual socket 48 core nodes um, with the Skylakes, they're 24 core SKUs of Skylake, the, you know, which we just learned the three, five, and seven numbering Intel had, and they of course changed it. So they went from something easy to remember like Skylake to something the marketing guys said much easier to remember. So now I think they're the Intel server scalable platinum 8160P or something like that. Clearly easier to remember than Skylake. Um, but uh, so we have this, you know, 24 per socket, but two sockets on a board or 68 cores on there, lots of cores. Um, if you throw GPUs in there, then you have all kinds of crazy heterogeneity. Um, some of those nodes have MCD RAM, right? The on-chip fast memory, um, soon to just be generically known as high bandwidth memory when they move to generation two. But this MCD RAM means we have 16 gigabytes of RAM that is on the chip um, for the Knight's Landing nodes. Sometimes it is a cache and sometimes it is not. Think about that when writing um, your system software library for it, right? You can map it um, with a boot time option. Unfortunately, it's only at boot time. Um, so then we get into the joy of rebooting nodes between jobs. Um, uh, at the moment, you can just pick a queue in the right mode and we move them at maintenance times. But uh, so you can either take that 16 gig and have it be a cache against 96 gig of main memory. Um, you can imagine the issues of having, it's a direct mapped cache, by the way. Um, so you only have 
six pages of main memory for every uh, page in the cache um, that you can map into. So you can get into all sorts of interesting file sharing problems um, and things like that. Uh, or you can boot it to be just an addressable part of memory. So you have your 16 gig of fast and 96 gig of slow and 112 gig total. Um, you know, where your network code is allocating memory suddenly is a big deal in terms of performance. And knowing the mode the chip is booted in, and by the way, that's the very broad. You can also partition between the two. You can do subnuma clustering within the chip so that you have four banks of four gigabytes. Um, the different sets of cores can see. There's actually like 16 modes um, to put the memory in, each of which requires its own tuning um, around this. But to first order, it's cache or not cache. Um, so there's lots of things to think about that are subtle in the network layer that I'm not sure um, when they put out these chips and say, yeah, you can just change it, that they really think through the performance implications of all of those things. Um, but so our team for this one, um, and again, Intel funds, uh, NSF funds you once um, to buy the machine, so that's just the vendors um, with us. But when we start operations on the machine, we have the much bigger team. We have lots of partners in lots of different roles. Um, but in particular, we once again have Ohio State and DK's team on board for tuning this interconnect. Um, so we create all of these problems of different core counts and sockets um, and memory hierarchy layers, and then we say, hey, DK, fix it. So that's kind of how this works, and Ari can testify to that <laughs> in person. So, um, but anyway, timelines, again, um, these are very long processes, and you have to sort of adapt on the fly, right? We got. Um, as our Christmas present, a write this proposal in three months letter um, right before Christmas in 2014. Um, we submitted the proposal in 2015. It really was 15 months before we could actually admit that they had funded it um, in June of 2016. Um, and again, we started phase one delivery in the spring, uh, December to April. Um, we were scheduled for a July 1st start for operations. We did, in fact, make that. We put users on and started accounting June 14th. Um, uh, widely, so it's been up about two months now um, at this point. And again, in October, we'll do phase two, and eventually we'll do phase three. And in theory, this is going to be our platform through 2021, so we have lots of time to do this um, optimization. So a couple of interesting things about the machine. We'll come back to the network. Um, I thought I'd fix this. Oh, well. Um, this makes me worry about what else is in safe. Uh, for some reason, the captions wrap around for Ranger and Stampede. But you know, we saw Ranger, our old machine, was sort of 100 cabinets. Physically, it looked like that in our data center, 3,000 square feet, um, 3 megawatts. Um, Stampede got a lot bigger physically. We built on that second part of the data center. Um, so it was 8,000 square feet. We never did do a second card um, in all the nodes, which would have taken us to 6.5 megawatts at 10 petaflops as we deployed it and, um, before we did some upgrades later in life. It started out about 4.5 megawatts. But again, 182 cabinets, so it's a physically sort of giant thing. Um, in phase one of Stampede 2, because we don't have these big, bulky PCI cards in the nodes anymore, um, we got a lot denser. So this is how we're able to run half of Stampede 1 and bring up phase one of Stampede 2, even though they sit in the same physical space. Um, as you might imagine, running the network cables in this environment was fun. Not interrupting service in Stampede. We took one maintenance on Stampede 1 to do this, and that's when we cut the core switches out. Um, the four core switches, but otherwise we ran through this. So Stampede 2 Phase 1 just fits in the first few rows there, and the back half is still a running version of Stampede, even though we literally went through the cable trays between those with pruning shears um, <laughs> um, to remove them. So you have these big bundles of truncated fiber. Um, if you want to come see it in the data center, you saw we had good burn orange cable from Mellanox. Um, the UT color for Stampede 1 and the Stampede 2 color is like sky blue. It's not nearly as intimidating or anything. So, um, you know, but you can come through and you walk through blue cables and suddenly you see these, you know, ugly trunks where we went through with pruning shears and it changes to burn orange cable as you work through. Um, and that's when you know you've switched from two to one um, walking through the data center. And again, this is already, um, what, 12 petaflops um, of, uh, in Stampede 2 that's deployed already. Um, and a lot less power, as I'll get to. Um, but you see the density has gone way up. And of course, everybody wants to know about application performance, so let me say a few things about where we are on Knight's Landing. Um, this is just sort of Stampede 1 node to Stampede 2 node performance. This is an early one that I started showing last year. Um, we got the first Knight's Landings. We did a Knight's Landing upgrade to one, um, added a few hundred nodes, so we had some ramp time. 
And um, what you sort of see is if your code can really use a lot of cores well, um, it does pretty well. We're getting three or four or five times the GTC is the fusion code um, out of Princeton. The dash P stands for Princeton there, gyrokinetic turbulence code. Um, the lattice Boltzmann code there, LBM, both of those are really good OpenMP, MPI hybrid codes that are well-tuned, so they really get sort of your theoretical performance um, max. Most NAMD, WARF, pretty good codes, you get sort of three to one. Things like Flash are really, you know, very sensitive to clock rate um, and don't do nearly as well, um, frankly. So this is just Sandy Bridge to k and um, Knight's Landing. Now we're adding Skylake, and Skylake is really fast also really expensive. Um, but so if you look at Skylake, um, and this is the stuff that I had as more or less a non-disclosure until recently, um, you see that, again, if you're super well-tuned, you can get sort of the same performance out of Knight's Landing and Skylake. Namdi's close, Wharf is close. Um, but if you have things that are clock rate sensitive, like Gromax or Flash, um, clearly Skylake, and Skylake looks good in every case. Um, but the thing left out here is Skylakes cost a lot more <laughs> than Knight's Landing nodes. You have twice as many DIMMs, you have two sockets instead of one. And so the price difference is really like 60 to 65%, both at discount and at list um, when you look at it. So if you go through and you look at um, Skylake versus Knight's Landing and you normalize for cost, you get very different graphs. Um, where in fact, um, and this is again running the same code everywhere. If you start putting in code optimization, you get a mess, because it turns out code tuned to go fast runs better than code not tuned to go fast, and that has really nothing to do with hardware. Um, so this is as checked out of GitHub versions of all of these codes, the standard download. Um, but suddenly, there are still some cases where Skylake is the best one, but for many cases, Knight's Landing makes more sense per dollar um, when you start looking about buying performance. Um, but it's still mixed, which is why we built the machine the way we did. Um, you know, with partially Knight's Landing and partially Skylake. Um, and this is normalizing for cost. The other interesting thing to do, and again, we're in all Knight's Landing today, is normalize for power. Um, so this is the top 500 today. Um, and uh, by the way, I didn't know the number 11 system had that number. If you look at the RMAX numbers, we're like 3% from it. We just took our first run and submitted it because running Linpack is basically a giant waste of time on a system that depreciates at fifty thousand dollars a day. Um, so, uh, you know, we did one run in twelve hours and submitted the number. If I'd known there was a machine three percent faster, we would have done another run and beaten it I mean, <laughs> and moved up a spot. Let me just be clear about that. So, you know, one more day, we could have taken it out. Um, but it still serves to illustrate my point here, which is: so you have uh, at eleven. Actually, even if we include 10, right? So 10 is a Broadwell-based system, so you see the 2698v3 Intel processor. Um, the Met Office system there is a, uh, sorry, yeah, it's a, v3 is Haswell, v4 is Broadwell, right? The 18-core Broadwell part, so best until Skylake became available three weeks ago. Um, uh, roughly the same performance in Broadwell you know, delivered, and then we are in Knight's Landing. Look at the power column on the far right, right? We are half the power of an equivalent performance Broadwell system in Knight's Landing. So if you start looking at performance per watt, even though raw performance doesn't look great, um, Knight's Landing gets pretty compelling again. Um, I wish Intel had looked at this sooner before some of the changes they're making now. But um, so you see we're dramatically less. I mean, that is a petaflop faster. Um, at Trinity, uh, but even though, uh, well, again, if you look at you know, relatively comparable R maxes um, and dramatically different R peaks, because of course we can realize a lower percentage with the Knight's Landing of peak, but if you just look at the delivered max, um, there's a pretty big power difference there, right? 1.8 megawatts, I mean, that cost me $1.2 million a year um, in difference in cost. So that's a pretty significant number um, in terms of that. So sort of where we are, as we continue to have explosions of cores and MCD RAM and other things, and looking at future processors, um, we know that less cores and more clock rate would be better if we could ignore cost and power, right? I mean, we'd really rather get power nines with eight cores and five gigahertz, right? Um, given the option. We know that if you're optimizing for the single job case, that that's the best thing to do. Um, if you're optimizing for how much computing can I get out of $10 million, 
um, you have a very different optimization point. And it's frankly a weird one um, that we're in right now because traditionally in high performance computing or high end computing, you know, it's how fast can we run uh, the fastest and sexiest problem that we can come up with, right? What is the turnaround time on one problem? Um, but if it's how fast we can run all the science that we can run for a fixed budget, we have to approach the problem a little differently because of this normalized for cost and normalized for power um, kind of thing. So if you ask me today, if you have good parallel code, which again is not most of the code in the universe, but if you have good, a good parallel MPI code, um, the most power efficient and cost efficient way to run it is to use a Xeon Phi. Um, and in fact, if you throw a GPU in there, price a P100 and then price the Skylake node to put it in, um, you start to realize that for the price of two, um, you know, a dual GPU node, you can buy four Knight's Landing nodes. Right? So um, when you start thinking about it in, for a fixed budget, how much can I deliver over the life of the machine, you get a different answer than if you say, how fast can I run this one problem? Um, and so the question is, what do you want to do? Um, and that is a question that I think as a community we need to work on a little bit um, as to what our answer is. So at the moment we're splitting the difference and doing some of both. Um, but looking forward it gets interesting into how we're going to deliver performance. So, um, so of course there's also the Omnipath and I didn't um, have a chance, again we've only had the big fabric up for a couple months but we've had a few hundred nodes up for a long time in this. So this is a uh, um, looking at Omnipath scaling, and again, this isn't us, this is uh, from a paper that was published at ISC, so they only had access to some nodes, but these are two machines with similar, not quite the same skew, but pretty close to the same skew of Knight's Landing, um, Corey out at NERSC, and uh, Stampede 2, uh, and this is the AWP code, so this is a seismic code out of SCEC and SDSC at Southern California. Um, Yifeng Kui's paper is what is uh, quoted here, and so Yifeng did some scaling studies, and you see out he only had 128 nodes of STEM P2 at the time to run on um, when he put this in for ISC in June, so he actually ran it in March. Um, but you see scaling on Omnipath, scaling, and so this is sort of a memory bandwidth intensive code. It scales pretty well, um, but the, you know, we can scale Omnipath, uh, in this case at least, just as well as you can scale Ares or anything else. Um, so we haven't had much in the way of scaling issues um, around the Omnipath fabric. So what we did have, of course, is the job launch issues. So this is the same graph I showed earlier, but once again, um, even though we've changed fabrics and even though Mvapich was built around InfiniBand, and even though Omnipath is really mostly InfiniBand, just the other, you know, the QLogic stuff, um, once again, even across fabrics now, Mvapich has been a huge help to us um, in being able to do things. And of course nowadays um, we use MPI in some fairly different ways. You know, we talk about AWP and Wharf and Gromax and all the other stuff, but we're running a lot of different workloads. So this one, by the way, courtesy Jerome for putting this together, Jerome Vien. This courtesy Zhao Zhang and some of our data team, Wei Zhizhu, et cetera, um, who are looking at running um, how we do on the machine learning codes across uh, now Phi versus GPUs on different things. So first we did some uh, sorry, I apparently didn't click save the last time because I fixed these captions too. They're in black against the background. So the first graph on the left here is a strong scaling plot um, where we had already tuned the number of threads and this is CAFE um, and then ComNet, CAFEnet, AlexNet and GoogleNet are various both neural net configurations and data sets that were used to win this Google runs this image classification um, contest every year and these are like the last four winners um, over different years and people have started using them as benchmarks. So it specifies both the layout in terms of layers and neuron counts and then a data set to run it on. Um, and so first we tuned it, I think we figured 64 threads um, on a k and it was sort of optimal for running CAFE um, and so the strong scaling plot on your left here is showing that um, we have so one KNL is a single scan P2 node versus a node with a K40 GPU and a node with a P100. And clearly and unequivocally the P100 is the fastest way to run this um, on one node, right? Um, there's just no way around that. Um, but for many of these benchmarks, by the time you get two KNLs and you start throwing some MPI in there with CAFE, um, so that we have one, two, four, and eight stampede nodes there, at two the P100 is not unequivocally um, the fastest way to run it. And if you just, you know, you know what we spent on the machine, you know how many nodes we have, 
you know that stamp that you also had to buy storage and interconnect and switches, and you know that Skylake nodes are 60% more than landing nodes. Um, you can sort of figure out what we paid for node. And so I would argue that a node with AP100 is worth three KNLs um, in cost uh, at the very least. So at two, the argument is a little fuzzier. Right? Um, so we didn't have voltas in time um, to do any of this. By the way, this is from a talk at the Xeon Phi users group that Zhao put in a paper around. Not yet published, but it's coming. Um, so, uh, and then you know, we continue to scale. Some things scale OK at four and eight. Um, and again, so this is strong scaling, same problem. We also did some weak scaling on the other side there, and this is to large numbers. Um, and you see you get, eh, kind of okay, um, decent scaling, but you can actually scale these problems out. Uh, there's really sort of diminishing returns beyond going past 128, but we've scaled them out to 1,024 nodes of KNL. Um, you know, IBM put out a press release Friday, I think, that they had gotten, what, TensorFlow out to 256 GPUs and they felt that was newsworthy somehow. And we're like, okay, if that's news, but we'd run out to 1024, this was a couple months ago, so, um, well, June, I guess, so. Um, but you can see that there's a lot of work left to do in making these codes work really well um, at very large scale, but they're at least improving in the strong scaling case for one, two, four, and eight. Um, there is the potential to make these more parallel, and there's a lot of work left to do in that. So, um, down to about six minutes left, so let me wrap up. So are we done? <laughs> with the, is Mvapich ready? Just we should release it, never do anything ever again? Are we finished? No, we still have lots and lots of challenges ahead um, in terms of there. So um, I look forward to many more years <laughs> of working together on doing these things, right? So we have the fact, as I've talked about a lot of times, we're building much more complex and heterogeneous nodes. We have core counts rising. We have multi-sockets. We have GPUs. We have more layers of a memory hierarchy that add different performance characteristics. We're going to start throwing NVDRAM in there, which is going to be way slower than DRAM, but might be what we have. Um, so obviously, uh, I guess what uh, Zhao Yi is going to do this talk tomorrow, but virtualization and containers are playing a bigger and bigger role on Stampede and Stampede 2 now. You can run Singularity on every single node, um, which is great, which is not great if you're trying to do a very tuned um, you know, thousand node wharf run, um, but if you're running one node of Python in a bio app, um, it's just as good or even four nodes in bio apps. A lot of the batch um, sort of throughput stuff works just fine out of singularity, lets us support thousands of apps. Um, so you know, we have these more pervasive container levels that are going to sit between us and getting performance. And the Mvapage team has already tackled some of those issues, but that'll keep going. Um, Topology is going to keep changing, right? If you look at what the cloud guys are doing, they're very focused on the rack as the unit. <laughs> we're probably going to have a lot of really good connectivity between racks. Um, and we're going to have really crappy connectivity, I mean, within a rack, very good connectivity, between racks, really lousy connectivity, and so this sort of topology is going to be less and less balanced over time, and they run enough of the market that we're all going to end up buying those racks. And then, of course, the workloads are changing to these big data, MLDL, machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence codes. Um, I expect in the end, because you can get performance in the same way, they're all going to look like, they're all going to be MPI codes um, when all is said and done. Um, when they figure out that we've already solved these problems that they're trying to solve. Um, but there's going to be a lot new tuning around um, how they balance their workloads. So even though they'll use MPI, they'll become Mvapich applications and we'll have to tune for them. So, you know, a performant message passing software stack has been crucial for us for many years and it's going to keep being crucial, I think, for many, many years to come. Um, because these machines are just not the same <laughs> when you get under the covers and we're going to have to keep tuning. There's no one library. Um, without future work that's going to future proof us against all technologies. We have to keep developing and making new innovations and doing um, cool things. And do keep in mind, you know, why we do this. To do rocket engines, to do offshore platforms, all of these were stampede problems. Um, that is some things, simulations of early galaxies that are targeting the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, assuming they're still in NASA next year, that, that gets launched um, at the end of next year. To health things, that's looking at uh, uh, genetic pathways between, um, in the upper image, between uh, Alzheimer's and glioblastoma, the more aggressive brain cancers, and where we can cross treatments. We have the stroke diagnosis from imaging. Um, so the software that all of you contribute to in Mvapich um, is really key to helping us change the world. So with that, thanks very much, and thanks for having me here.
um, and keep making us great software. We appreciate it, and we're forever in your debt for it. So.